I'm going to get started and let everybody continue to, to roll in while I'm talking so uh, we can get get everybody ready to the to the panelists tonight. Um, I'm excited to welcome you all to our Build Local, Eat Local webinar. Uh, I am not only passionate about regional food systems, but have personally invested quite a bit of sweat equity into these systems and, and come up against a number of the barriers that the panelists tonight are going to be touching on. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, my name is Sarah Cardin. I am the uh, senior policy advocate here at Farm Action and Farm Action Fund. And uh, we are here today to talk about using the farm belt to support a food and farm system where regional food systems are the norm instead of the exception. Uh, empowering farmers to grow food for their communities instead of forcing them is to cogs for a corporate Ponzi scheme. So I'm very excited to introduce to you um, our panelists tonight. We have with us tonight, Greg Gunthorpe, owner of Gunthorpe Farms, Jean Jonas, owner and farmer at Hungry Bear Farm, uh, Donna McClish, founder and CEO of Common Ground Producers and Growers, and Wes King, legislative aide for Senator Sherrod Brown. Uh, so tonight I'm gonna start by opening the webinar, giving you a little bit of context for why we're here, and then we will hear from the panelists about their work and the opportunities that they see in the Farm Bill. And following that, we'll have time for a Q&A before a brief closeout. So we're here today to help bring awareness and opportunity to awareness, um, excuse me, to the opportunity that the Farm Bill presents. Um, as many of you know, the Farm Bill is the skeletal backbone for our food and farm system. And it right now is putting corporate interests ahead of everything else, including our health, our economy, our nutrition, our environment, and our communities. Uh, so with the next Farm Bill coming up around the corner, we are gathering to address this huge opportunity and lay the groundwork for a farming system that supports everyone up and down the food supply chain, from farmers to workers and all the way up to consumers. And this is the founding basis for Farm Action's Fair Farm Bill campaign. Um, for those of you who are less familiar with our campaign, it is organized around four pillars. Many of you joined us in February when we co-hosted the Food Not Feed Summit. Uh, this is the first pillar of our Farm Bill campaign. We were joined by nearly a thousand participants and 40 organizations as we rallied around a farm bill that empowered farmers to grow healthy, nutritious food for their communities instead of just forcing them into livestock feed crops like corn and soybeans. Uh, two weeks ago, a number of you joined us at a webinar on our second pillar, Justice for All, where we talked about policies that would help center equity in our farm bill. And today we're here to talk about our third pillar, build local, eat local. And then in two weeks, we hope to see you all again at our webinar on our fourth pillar, conservation and regeneration. So first, let me tell you a little bit about the background for Build Local, Eat Local. Agricultural policy over the last several decades has worked to increasingly consolidate and centralize our food and farm system at the benefit to no one aside from a handful of dominant corporations. Farmers must sell into highly concentrated markets and accept whatever prices they are offered. Consumers are facing empty shelves and are exposed increasingly to corporate price gouging behaviors. So in order to liberate farmers from these corporate chokeholds and also build resiliency into our food system, we need a farm bill that will begin to decentralize our food and farm system by creating and supporting a more regionalized distribution networks. This is the goal of our Build Local, Eat Local pillar. So how do we do this? Well, first, we need to strip corporations of their excessive market control. And we can do that by strengthening and enforcing already existing antitrust laws. But we also need to address other pathways that have allowed corporations to corrupt our food system, such as addressing the checkoff program and uh, fraudulent labeling practices. So if we can make some of these kinds of changes, this will help to level the playing field so that there is an actual market space and opportunity for regional food systems to thrive. And while we're doing this, we need to simultaneously invest heavily in regional food systems, which have been heavily eroded over the past several decades. Um, 
without doing this, they won't be able to rise the opportunity that we can create by enforcing these antitrust laws and these other types of corporate checks that we're discussing. Uh, so how do we invest in regional food systems? We need to do things like support farmers who are working on transitioning or building up their operations to support more regionalized food focused production models. Uh, we also need to invest and in, uh, build up our investments in supporting infrastructure. And we need to give our farmers procurement support while these markets develop and stabilize. Uh, this is why I am so excited to introduce to you some of the panelists today. They are here today to talk to you about the ways that we can accomplish this. They have all been working on the front lines of regional food systems and can tell you about the kinds of changes that we need to be making. Um, before I turn it over to them, I just want to give you a couple little housekeeping items. Uh, for those of you who are less familiar with the Zoom webinar format, um, you'll notice we you may have you've lost your chat box, but there's a Q and A icon at the bottom of your screen. Um, I'm going to encourage you all to start dropping questions as the panelists speak, so that when we get to the Q and A portion, we can get to as many of the questions as possible. Um, so with that, I want to turn it over to Greg. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, Greg Gunthorpe uh, from Gunthorpe Farms in Northeast Indiana. Uh, we have a um, family farm. Uh, we raise pastured pigs, pastured poultry, and grass-fed uh, lambs. And we are unique in that we have a USDA-inspected uh, red meat and poultry slaughter and processing operation on the farm. Uh, our product is primarily sold to uh, upscale restaurants within our region, but does go out of the region some. We have uh, product at um, O'Hare in the airport. Uh, we have product at the clubhouse at Wrigley Field. Uh, we um, produce some product uh, that goes to Disney in Orlando, Florida. So um, uh, really, really short story of ours uh, so that you can understand uh, where I'm coming from. Uh, I'm the generation that lived the um, extreme consolidation of the hog industry. Uh, my family's raised pigs for at least four generations. And uh, my wife and I sold live pigs in 1998 for less than what my grandpa sold them for in the depression. Uh, I said I wasn't gonna quit. Uh, we built a processing plant on the farm and uh, built some markets. And so today I'm here to shortly talk to you about uh, uh, my thoughts on what we need big picture um, from a um, farm bill and then uh, how I've actually lived some of those and how I think that uh, the USDA and the Farm Bill uh, provides a serious impediment uh, to the ability to uh, rebuild local and regional food systems. Uh, I have um, four components that I believe that are uh, necessary in rebuilding uh, local and regional um, foods on the, especially on the meat and poultry side. And I believe those are, um, we need subsidy reform, uh, we need antitrust enforcement, uh, we need labeling reform, and we need inspection reform. Um, the, I, I think they're all obvious, but, uh, you know, to um, uh, just talk about them really shortly. Uh, my family, um, up until the um, pandemic, um, I think we'd got around, uh, the environmental working group posted the numbers, but I think we'd got around $30,000 um, in subsidies uh, since starting as, you know, uh, leaving my parents' farm in 1994. Uh, so, you know, less than a thousand or right at a thousand dollars a year. Um, the subsidy system, both direct and indirect, uh, because we don't qualify for uh, revenue risk insurance either, um, definitely uh, is aimed at the larger farms and is aimed at uh, corn and soybeans, which is largely an input for confinement production. Puts uh, independent family farms. Uh, especially those that are um, selling their product to the end user at a severe disadvantage. Um, and, you know, we need to change that if we're going to um, uh, have any kind of local and regional food system. A good friend of mine, Mike Calicrate, always says that uh, what you support uh, prospers. And it's definitely true in that case. Uh, we need strong antitrust enforcement. And that has to be more than just blocking mergers, blocking acquisitions. It has, also has to include strong ethics on um, support. Um, you know, the it's uh, people, unless you've actually went out and tried to sell into this wholesale market, I don't think people realize just how concentrated it is 
uh, you know, and that kind of ties into my next one. And I think this antitrust enforcement ties into a lot of them because, you know, when you uh, build excessive uh, power um, in a marketplace, you also tend to build excessive power with the uh, um, politicians and the bureaucrats in Washington, D.C. And labeling uh, reform is highly, highly needed. Uh, every single um, viable niche that we've created, uh, whether that's, you know, in my case, uh, pastured um, poultry or whether it's, uh, you know, pastured pigs, um, but it's also the organic milk producers, it's natural, it's grass fed, you name it. Uh, the big guys have uh, invaded those spaces uh, with little more than a, um, their marketing programs, changing the labels. Um, and then uh, we need some uh, strong uh, support from an inspection, uh, an inspection system that works. The inspection systems tend to be rope for the big guys. And, you know, I'm a big fan of uh, meat inspection. Uh, but I think that the USDA could use a little bit of uh, reform on that regards. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm not sure how long I've talked here, but uh, probably took too long. But um, I think that uh, overall, if we're going to rebuild local and regional food systems, um, you know, we have we have to put some money into it. Uh, we have to put some effort into it and we have to make sure that um, uh, that is what we prioritize. And uh, over the last uh, decades, uh, USDA has definitely not prioritized that. So um, I think that's about all I have to say for the, my beginning comments. Thank you. Thank you so much, Greg. You always paint a really clear whole picture of, of what you're facing out there. We really appreciate it. Um, next up, I'd love to introduce Jean Jonas to you all. Hey, everybody. Thanks for being here today. Uh, and thanks for inviting me to talk uh, Farm Action. Um, I was sent a series of questions, three questions by Sarah um, over the last couple of weeks. I've been totally straight out uh, farming, working 10, 12 hour days. <clears throat> uh, my field help just arrived yesterday, so. Uh, been working real hard. So I'm gonna try my best to answer uh, Sarah's questions here as I have not uh, been able to invest a lot of time into answering them uh, due to my farming responsibilities. <clears throat> so the first question um, Sarah asked was, what is your experience as a grower like trying to recreate a food distribution system, hurdles and barriers you face? Well, you know, uh, we're, um, <clears throat> We're a small farm here in South Central New Hampshire, and we grow produce to organic standards. We're not certified to the USDA. And um, we've been doing this for 13, going on 14 years. We sell direct to consumer through our CSA. Prior to that, we were doing farmer's markets. Uh, so still direct to consumer. <clears throat> uh, I, I never really tried to recreate a food distri distribution system by myself. <laughs> I've just been trying to be the best farmer I can be and, and contribute to a uh, food distribution system in our area. Uh, some, of the, some of the things I've witnessed over the years is the lack of uh, uh, support from our community uh, um, with regards to buying local produce. Um, uh, it's a long story where New Hampshire is a, a, the second oldest state in, in the 50 states of the United States, right behind Maine, just above Vermont. So we're a grain population, which doesn't help um, local sales too much as, you know, a lot of my customers are, you know, older than me, which is pretty old. <clears throat> um, I have been involved in a number of efforts locally in my off time to try to develop what's uh, called a food hub. And some of these organizations um, failed due to lack of support and direction. Uh, there are a couple of <clears throat> efforts underway regionally still to try to, to do that. 
uh, food hubs offer a good alternative source of sales for a lot of our existing farms around here, um, rather than the food co-ops, which tend to just support the larger farms in our area uh, that are willing to sell to them at the prices they dictate, <clears throat> which is not often affordable to the multitude of smaller farms that predominate the landscape here in uh, New Hampshire and New England. Um, so I'm, I'm hopeful that some of these efforts will come to fruition. <clears throat> so the second question was, what are some of your successes? Why do you think local is better? Well, local producers build community, local economy, and food resiliency. Um, it's fresher food, for sure, often grown to organic standards. Um, and in our farm, you know, we, um, we have a pickup at the field and uh, today was no exception. <clears throat> so people come out every Tuesday on our farm and uh, <clears throat> they pick up fresh produce. I was, I was harvesting fresh today for people. Uh, and what wasn't harvested fresh was harvested probably within the last 48 hours. This opportunity, this, this offers an opportunity to educate people on exactly how their food is grown. You'd be surprised to know that a lot of, a lot of people, especially young kids, unfortunately, you know, don't know that a carrot is grown in the ground. So when they come out to our farm and visit that, you know, they see it firsthand and they bite into that carrot and man, they love it. I'll tell you, it's, it's great. So there's a whole reason, a uh, whole lot of reasons why local is better. Um, the third question Sarah asked was, how can the government do a better job supporting producers like, like ourselves who are not conventional and not selling it to conventional outlets? Well, the government can do, in my, my opinion, <clears throat> a hell of a lot better job than it has been doing. Um, they can begin to fund, put money into <clears throat> funding local regional projects that will enhance the food system in that area. I don't know that anything like that exists in the farm bill, but you know, in 2020, when the when the pandemic first hit, and um, a lot of our customers who joined up rapidly saw probably for the first times in their lives, empty shelves at the local supermarket um, that really hit them. You know, our so-called <clears throat> big efficient food system in this country, well, when it was hit with a a pandemic, which we frequently occur, ha happens in this country, wasn't so efficient. It was exposed. People rushed to uh, local producers like ourselves. And uh, a lot of the <clears throat> farms around here saw record uh, signups that year for CSA and visits at their farmers' markets and stands and so forth. So, I mean, I think. The government, if it wasn't so busy focused on uh, <clears throat> giving money to the moneyed interests that you know lobby in Washington for that, uh, we we could do a hell of a lot better throughout this country, feeding our communities wherever it makes sense to do so. Uh, there's just a new a number of ways that I think that the government can do a better job of supporting producers, uh, regional producers. Um, they could offer low interest loans and grants to first time farmers and uh, 
farmers who want to get back back on the land. There's a lot of farms have, that have gone out of business in this region, <clears throat> more so uh, than those have come into business in the last 14 years, in my experience. So we're, we're steadily losing farms in this area. Uh, and I, I, I know that, you know, monopolization and consolidation is, you know, gutting rural communities throughout the country. And uh, who's that benefit? Few big players, right? Few big players at the top of the heap. Um, everyone else is forced to <clears throat> suffer, basically, with higher prices and less quality food. Um, I've always been a big advocate for educating people on the true cost of food, uh, which is not really heard of too much. But um, if one was to dive into <clears throat> the, um, the actual systems that are used to produce our food, there's a lot of uh, costs that have been allowed to be externalized uh, by these <clears throat> larger institutions, agribusinesses, and so forth. So for instance, who's responsible for cleaning up the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico due to, you know, agricultural nitrogen runoff? Nobody. So our system allows that to happen, but it's passed along to the populace as a whole. For instance, we, spend about a trillion dollars a year in this uh, country on food, but we spend another trillion dollars a year on healthcare costs due to diet related diseases, due to the crappy food that our system, that our so-called efficient food system produces. Diseases like cancer, diabetes, hypertension, uh, you know, our government doesn't address this. Our government is focused on feeding the moneyed interests that ex already exist. <clears throat> so if it, we were to uh, turn that around 180 degrees, our government would be funding projects that are dedicated to building up the resiliency of food systems locally, wherever it makes sense to do so. You know, we're kind of putting our eggs in a couple of baskets in this country, which is stupid. <clears throat> Dean, I, I, I don't want to interrupt because you're getting right into the meat of all the good stuff here. <laughs> um, and this is everything we're here to talk about, but I just... I want to make sure we give some time to Q and A and to the other panelists. So okay. If okay. You don't... Sorry. Sorry. No, this was great. This is exactly um... kind of a stream of consciousness talk here because you know <laughs> I'm tired. I've been up since five thirty in the morning. <laughs> well, we've got some questions headed your way, so we're coming back. But okay. I... Oh, I, um, I want to thank you. Um, and okay. I just want to give um, introduce to everybody now, uh, Donna McClish. Um, from Common Ground Producers and Growers. All righty, good afternoon, everyone. And Sarah, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I will reiterate the fact that I thoroughly enjoyed the Food Not Feed Summit in Washington, D.C. recently, and it was an eye-opener. And um, as I travel along this path, I continue to be amazed at how our systems have been um, our systems have been um, weighed down with uh, monopolization and um, just a, just overburdened with all of the unnecessary um, things that have been piled on it. And COVID, first, and thank you for inviting me today. Um, COVID changed the game, the food game, considerably. So what it did for us, uh, Common Ground is a mobile market, mobile food hub. 
in Wichita, headquartered in Wichita, Kansas, and we serve um, 12 counties and we are expanding our, our uh, footprint across the state as much as possible, as quickly as possible. So when COVID came, and I'm an urban farmer, but we do have a farm. And when COVID came, our urban systems were completely thrown off. Um, it was like someone was looking down in the, the, at the roof and then they decided to pull the uh, tiles off the roof or whatever those things are called. And we're looking down on our food system and saying there's empty shelves in the grocery stores. Um, there's people can't afford the food. And recently there were, uh, in Kansas, there were 63,000 SNAP beneficiaries that were affected by uh, the SNAP benefits, the pre-COVID SNAP benefits or, or the COVID can, uh, SNAP benefits be taken away. And now we're talking about the shift in healthcare. But I believe strongly that as an urban agriculturist and, and, a, and a person that's been in this business a while, that good food, good healthy food, it is at the root of what we need to think about. And I appreciate Jean and Greg's comments that we have to get back to the local farmer. Um, and, and I have a quote from Mary Benson, one of the key solutions to a secure food system is more and more local small farms. So Common Ground believes that if we empower the local farmer to do what he does, to provide food for his community. We will have healthy farmers, we will have healthy food, we will have healthy communities, we will have healthy families. That does not mean that I can bring a truckload of corn and put it in the middle of an urban street. It does no good. So our people that are needing the food are also suffering several social determinants of health. Uh, lack of housing, lack of food, lack of good water. All of these things go to make up what the, the total food system. And until we can impact the farm bill by food not being a profit issue, but a policy issue, then we can begin to turn this system around. Because if we know anything, COVID came, we weren't ready. The next round, we want to be ready. However, COVID is still lingering. So the effects of COVID are still there. So we have to, when we shift, as we shift into this new system and re-envisioning this food system, we have to make the shift so it's permanent. So Common Ground believes that there are three things we need to do. We need to pay our farmers an equitable wage. Farmers need to be paid for what they do. They need to be paid so they can secure their families, their financial status, whatever equipment, purchase equipment, all of that. Farmers need to be paid. So why not take some of this subsidies from traditional ag and share it with the farmers? Traditional ag is gonna to have to learn to share with us. That's part of the solution. The second thing we like, uh, we'd like to do is fill the gap between the prices that the farmer needs to make and the gap that we need to, the amount of what we charge the end customer. So if farmers are making 14 cents on a dollar on the average, we've got to up that to where farmers can make a living, as I said before, an equitable wage. We've got to keep our prices low enough for the end customer, customer to be able to afford it. That's where those subsidies come in, the meat in the middle, so we can uh, subsidize and bring those prices to the farmer up and keep our prices to our end customer affordable. So I know it's a balancing act, I, and I know it's something that hasn't been done. But however, we, we have an opportunity with this new farm bill to do things that have never been done before. So I think we're on the cutting edge. It, uh, as I said before, there, are, there were 63,000 families that were affected by the uh, food stamp benefit cuts. We serve a large senior population. So some of their benefits went from $200 to $23. So now we're looking at how do we cushion that the last two weeks of the month that they need food 
or the amount of food they need during the month, because what can $23 buy? So Common Ground looks is taking a look at how this system um, is going to look this, this season, how much food we're going to have to move, and how we're going to keep our prices equitable so our customers can afford it. So this is an opportunity to make significant long lasting changes through the new farm bill, support local producers with direct funding. There also needs to be some oversight of funding that is going to the states. Uh, a lot of these people that are in the state offices don't know, are not familiar with agriculture, are not familiar with uh, urban farming, and they don't know how to allocate this money properly. So if there was, a, there needs to be a significant oversight. And I say that from experience. <laughs> there needs to be a significant oversight of all of these funds that are coming through the um, um, a reduction plan and the Build Back Better plan. All of these funds coming down, there needs to be some substantial oversight and accountability to where these funds are going so they can get to the producer where they are, are, they are targeted to go to the producer and they need to get to the producer. Um, let me see. Um, I think that's about it. Um, thank you for that time and thank you for the opportunity to be an educational advocate for re-envisioning the food system in America. And I hope to see you guys on the, on the path to where we're going. Thank you so much. Thanks, Donna. That was great. Really appreciate it. And now I'm excited to introduce our last panelist. Um, we've heard from farmers and advocates, and now we're going to hear from Wes about what this looks like on the Hill. Uh, so here, Wes, take it away. Yep. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, and thanks to everybody at Farm Action for having me. And just wanted to say uh, I, I saw in the uh, the attendee list a number of names I recognize and just want to say hello to all the folks that are uh, um, who I've worked with over the years that I see on the uh, attendee list. Good to see your names out there. So let me start by saying that, you know, one of the things that Senator Brown, uh, uh, for those of you who don't know, let me just maybe say Senator Brown is the senior uh, senator from the great state of Ohio. Um, and he is the second most powerful um, Democrat on the Senate Agriculture Committee. He's been on the Senate Agriculture Committee his entire career um, as a senator. And, and one of the things that the senator whether it's the agriculture system, manufacturing, trade policy, healthcare policy, that he has done his whole career is center the needs of working people and the need to fight corporate power. Um, he's one of the few members of Congress who this has been central to what has motivated him as a person and his policies since, um, since joining uh, uh, the Senate uh, many, many years ago. As part of you know thinking about the food system and thinking about small farmers and how do we how do we support uh, uh, those who are trying to do things differently and fight corporate power? That's often the perspective he's taken and we've taken as an office. We you know to everything Greg said, like one hundred percent support um, efforts to address trust issues. Um, we do need more labeling integrity. Uh, um, all of these issues are things that that, that the senator cares about. What he's tried to focus on, recognizing that there are others who are making that fight, um, he's tried to focus on what do we do to build the alternatives? How do we support uh, um, those who are trying to set up meat, new small meat processing facilities, those small farmers who are trying to build food hubs, trying to build networks in their communities to make local, healthy, fresh food more available? Um, you know, one of the things that... Um, also, I, I heard Gene and Donna, you both mentioned was COVID. And this is one of the things that uh, I think, you know, COVID revealed to us the, the fragility of a mm -hmm. food system that is based on long national global supply chains. And it revealed the need to um, address or invest more in local and regional food systems. This is not something that uh, was new to the Senator, was new to our office, or probably new to most of you on this call who have been kind of working in this space for many years. But it showed to many others in the American public mm -hmm. that this is a real issue, that we mm -hmm. 
don't have redundancy. We don't have resiliency in our food system. Mm -hmm. And we need to focus on that. And that's, you know, it fits with who the senator was before the pandemic, and it fits with who he is still to this day. And that's really uh, uh, where a lot of what we're going to be focusing on are uh, in, in the uh, current farm bill debate. Um, for those of you who may or may not know, you know, the senator has been the leader for local and regional food systems on the Senate Agriculture Committee for several farm bills now. If anybody's familiar with the Farmers Market and Local Food Promotion Program, well, he's the one who turned that into the Local Food Promotion Program in the 2014 Farm Bill. If anybody's mm -hmm. now familiar with LAMP, the Local Agriculture Market Program, which was created in the 2018 Farm Bill to provide a permanent baseline level of funding for local food systems programs. That was something that the senator championed and made happen. Now, I'll, I'll pause for a second to just recognize and acknowledge that these have been great accomplishments. These have been successes. But when, when looking at the scope of the problem and the size of our current food system and what we're up against, those are small, small wins, mm -hmm. uh, small victories. But they're still important uh, yeah. uh, towards building a, a more uh, uh, resilient and sustainable food system. So to, to that effect, tomorrow, um, the senator is going to be uh, um, introducing a, a, a piece of legislation called the Local Farms and Food Act. This is a marker bill that is aimed at uh, being included in the, the next farm bill that is really focused on how do we take that existing local agriculture market program and build on some of the past successes. How do we make it more um, equitable and accessible across the board, whether that's geography or income or, or, or you name it? How do we also you know, increase funding for that? We want to make take, take what we've already you know, put out there, some successes we've had, and continue to build upon those, improve and increase funding. Another thing I'll mention that the senator uh, um, introduced earlier this spring was called the local uh, the Strengthening Local Processing Act. Um, this is S-354, which is all about um, focusing on what are some changes we can make um, in the regulatory and inspection land when it comes to um, the Food Safety Inspection Service at USDA to try to make it a little easier for local processing facilities uh, to, to continue or expand or uh, uh, new, new uh, plants to start, as well as how do we get more investments in workforce development, recognizing that we also need the next generation of, of butchers um, and, and folks working in, in uh, whether it's a, you know, a mid-sized, small-sized plant or a local custom shop, there's training that is needed. And then, you know, the next thing I'll mention is that we're, also looking at, you know, to, you know, uh, Greg had brought up labeling integrity. And while this isn't um, specifically on, you know, some of those abuses that have taken place, whether it's grass fed or natural, you know, you name it, um, we're, we've been putting our, our behind the scenes, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, capital to an extent, I guess you would call it capital um, behind uh, bringing back um, country of origin labeling. Now, is that the, do we need more than that? Yeah, absolutely. But that I think could become a first step in getting more integrity within our labeling system altogether. And then the last thing I'll mention that something that we've been looking at and that I hope we're gonna be introducing legislation later in, uh, in the coming months as part of, coming weeks to months as part of this farm bill process is how do we take some of these lessons or some of these examples that cropped up during during the pandemic, um, it sounds like some of the work, Donna, you were involved in, where we, we were we stuck with this crazy scenario where we had farmers and producers who had food. And they had, we had community members who needed that food, but the farmers suddenly couldn't sell it places. They were lacking the ability to get it to where they normally would sell it to. And we had some of these ad hoc programs that were created. Um, they had good parts to it. You know, the Farmers Family Food Box program, some of it worked, definitely had some major problems. But how can we take what did work there and build on that and, and create more opportunities for, for community resilience in the face of disasters, whether that's a natural disaster, uh, um, 
human health disaster or what about something like an environmental disaster like one of the things we're dealing with here in o o Ohio, the East Palestine train derailment that led to a major chemical spill in a rural community. Can we support in the farm bill or one of the things we want to we want to try to do is 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 move forward with building new opportunities in the farm bill to support those kind of community based connections where a farmer in one community is feeding those in need in his own community. I'll I'll I'll, I'll leave it at that. Wes, that was great. Thank you. <laughs> I think most of us are pretty big fans of your boss here, but that's that's a pretty good summary of why why he's been so great in this and why we wanted you here to talk about that work. Um, so thank you to all of all of you for joining us. Um, we have a lot of questions that have been rolling in, so we are going to work through them. Um, Greg, did you want to jump in? Yeah. Can I make a couple comments? Yeah, uh, please. To, Let's um, uh, to to um, Wes's comments. Uh, Wes, I would I would love to see you guys uh, uh, put uh, an ombudsman or funding for an ombudsman for the um, small and very small plants uh, in the farm bill. I think that that would uh, you know there's been an awful lot of funding for technical resources, but not really uh, funding for uh, working through dysfunctional uh, relationships with um, inspection staff, and I think that is uh, very highly needed. Um, the other thing I would um, encourage uh, done is the expansion of that $200,000 grant program. I think it uh, for the um, custom and state inspected plants, uh, in my opinion, it did not affect us at all because we've been USDA inspected all along. But I think that was the best uh, meat and poultry grant program created uh, at the beginning of the pandemic because uh, that ended up uh, getting about 150 plants to commit to USDA inspection, which, you know, in a one way doesn't sound like a lot, but that's an average of three plants per state. And every single one of those would be plants that would do processing for uh, small farms and direct marketers. So, I mean, that drastically increases the opportunities for farmers to get animals processed, which is a huge, huge challenge. Yep. The other reason we need you here, Wes, is to keep listening. <laughs> um, all right. So this this first question is a, a little bit directed towards you, Wes, but everybody feel free to jump in, which is uh, we've been meeting with our senators and Congress people using farm action materials. They are submitting their priorities to the ag committees right now, and none of our action items are getting in, onto their priority lists. So frustrating. Please address how we can help them get it. So any insights you can share? Uh, I'm, that's a, that, that's a, uh, that's a, a excellent question. I yeah, I, you know uh, maybe hmm. Some sometimes it, it could could be a a bit of that you know one meeting isn't enough. Um, that you know you have to you have to keep in mind or, or think about the fact that you know. A, People like me sitting in the place I'm sitting uh, um, are typically like we're fielding five to 10 meetings a day from different groups who have different asks, have different needs, um, and not all of them are always on agriculture. I do environment and energy policy for the senator. So one moment I'm I'm hearing about an energy issue, the next minute I'm hearing about a recycling issue, the next meeting I'm hearing about farm bill. and if you're newer to these issues and, and don't have a background in them, like myself, I, for those of you who don't know, I worked for the National Sustainable Ag Coalition for a number of years before joining Senator Brown's office. So I've got a lot of familiar familiarity with these issues. So I'm able to hear what people say and, and process and react to that quickly. A lot of the other staffers who may not have that background I have and are dealing with three other, four other however many issues don't have the time to like figure out heads or tails of an issue so oftentimes just one meeting may be enough to put it on their radar and make them think about it a little bit but it takes a lot more than that to get them to to, to push it over the hill and get to the point where they're like yes this should be um, one of our priorities Thanks so much. Um, that's that's really, I think, from the outside, it's just really helpful to have that 
that side of insider perspective shared. Um, so this next question, we've got a couple questions about um, marker bills, and so I'm gonna I'm gonna put this out there for all of you. Um, I'm happy to share Farm Actions insights, but you know, please one of them, please comment on which of the introduced marker bills would best improve the farm bill. Alternatively, what specific things can citizens ask the Agriculture Committee to adopt, change, enhance in the farm bill to support local agriculture? Um, I think we've we've touched some of we've touched on this. We heard about a couple of great marker bills coming out of Senator Brown's office. Um, are any are there any bills that any of you would like to to highlight here? Sir. Oh, jump in, please. Um, oh. and there um, I don't have the specific number yet, and I think it, I'm just hearing uh decent rumors uh, that uh, there's some uh, things being floated around that would require USDA uh, on its procurement uh, for a percentage of that to be local. Uh, and so I think any uh, bills along those lines uh, would be much, much appreciated and much needed. Uh, you know, you mentioned in your opening comments that uh, USDA needs to provide some uh, kind of safeguards or some uh back market uh protection uh for this local food that's being developed and i think that's one of the ways is because right now uh none of the small producers have any access to selling to the usda procurement program i think they have 27 uh small businesses that are um, actually authorized to sell into it and uh, as far as i can gather Almost all of those just sell foreign product that's repackaged and sold to the USDA. Yeah, I mean, that is definitely, I, I brought it up in our opening comments for Farm Action. We really think that procurement support, and, and we're working on that in a number of different angles. We've, we've also been um, working on advocating to scale up the GUSNIP the, um, program and, and tie that strongly to local procurement. Um, do any of you others want to, to share any other marker bills that you want to highlight? Um, all right, well, I, we're going to move on, but there's a couple important bills that, that haven't been mentioned that I, I, I can't not mention tonight. Um, you know, we, we, we talked a little bit about checkoff reform. Um, there's a really important Opportunities for Fairness and Farming Act um, that is beginning to reform the checkoff program that that we would highly encourage folks to to um, advocate on behalf. Um, there's also, you know, we, I think Wes, you mentioned, um, but the at Pool we have the American Beef Labeling Act has been introduced, um, which would institute mandatory country of origin labeling requirements. Um, so those are a couple other bills, and and we are. We'll we'll get back to this and, and send some more around um, with in a follow up email uh, after this. Um, but so I want to make sure we can get to another of these questions um, that have been out there. Um, so this one looks. Uh, um, Jean mentioned that many kids don't know how their food is grown. I'm aware of farm to school programs, but are there any programs that support actual on-site school farms to help educate elementary school children about how their food is grown? Farms on school grounds could also provide an opportunity to educate children about healthy diets and foster an appreciation for farming done correctly, which would serve them well throughout their lives. Um, is anybody from, uh, familiar, Gene, do you want to comment or anybody familiar with any of these kinds of programs? Well, one of our CSA members today, um, who's been a longtime CSA member, she's a um, school teacher um, in a local school. And uh, she was talking to me about uh, the fact that they just uh, acquired funds to build a local, uh, a little um, high tunnel at their school. So they'll be able to um, start growing food. Um, she teaches in a high school. <clears throat> so there's one example that is current on my mind. <clears throat> and uh, I know of other uh, um, efforts around here by nonprofit organizations uh, here in South Central New Hampshire to, uh, and, and they've been working at it for a while to, uh, they have structures, they have high tunnels 
built, they've acquired the funds and the, the structures are there in place. And uh, they do have programs for uh, a local high school um, and uh, kids participate in a program. I'm not too familiar with it, so I can't speak in detail about it, but they, they do have the structures, they do have the students, they do have the funds, they do have the teachers and they do have the system uh, and it's been in place for a while and they've been teaching kids how to grow food uh, for their local communities. Um, I am not intimately aware of, uh, the, of all these um, kinds of systems that are around here, but there are a number of them. And uh, I, I encourage, you know, all schools to, to participate in that. And then there are people who are, who are looking into that and are thinking about along those lines. Uh, a lot of it boils down to politics, unfortunately. And uh, I feel from, from my understanding, <clears throat> the so-called blue states uh, are more uh, in tune with this than uh, uh, what, what's commonly referred as the red states. I don't want to get too political, <clears throat> but um, yeah, so there, there are good things happening and I encourage all those activities to uh, occur. Uh, teaching kids how to grow uh, food is awesome. That's how I learned. <laughs> uh, Wes and Donna, did you guys want to add to that? Yes. Um, Common Ground uh, Mobile Market and Mobile Food Hub, we employ inner city youth during our market season. Uh, we're connected with the Way to Work program by the city of Wichita. The city pays the youth to work and they, the city, the youth sign up with the city and they determine with what they want to do. And we've had workers, this will be our third season. We also have college interns. Uh, last year was our first uh, set of college interns that had never worked on the farm. So we work with a network of growers that grow for us. We aggregate the food. So our, our, our workers have an opportunity to go to the different farms we work with and they see the different types of farming. They see the personalities of the farm and they see what farm grows in the spring, what farm grows in the summer, what farm grows in the fall. And we had two college students that uh, were at our farm part of the time. And my brother grew some corn and they looked at the corn and um, he puts uh, olive oil on the corn to keep it from the, the some kind of uh, larva or something on the corn husk. And so the college students had never seen that. So they got a syringe and put it in the corn and and when they harvested the corn, they saw this beautiful corn that they had harvested and they took some of it home to their families. So they were from beginning to end, they, we, the, we let the children see the process of farming. And then we also go into the school system to help. But yeah, it's, it's nothing like seeing children uh, being on the farm, putting their hands in the dirt and, and, and uh, learning how farming is. It's not just getting on a big tractor, tractor, it's hard work. And it's uh, small farming is a little bit harder, I would think. <laughs> but anyway, yes, we work with a lot of youth in our community. I was just going to flag uh, um, that, you know, there is already a USDA Farm to School grant program that does fund some of this kind of activity. But as, you know, I mentioned earlier, it's too, it's much smaller than really what it needs to be. And one of the very weird, interesting things about things here in DC. The farm to school program is not part of the farm bill. It's part of the child nutrition reauthorization. So it's not one of those things that we're able to do in the farm bill. But I can tell you, if it was something that we had the opportunity to be pushing for, we, you know, the senator and our office would be pushing to increase funding for that farm to school grant program for, for all the reasons that Donna talked about for the re for the reasons Jean Jean mentioned and nothing like good sweet corn. Let me tell you the sweet corn how out here in DC as a Midwesterner, it it, it doesn't cut it. it. It's no good. <laughs> okay, so the takeaway for me is that we need kids and corn and everybody can come together <laughs> and unite there. Uh, 
Yeah, well, I just, I'm, we have a bunch more questions that um, we were not able to get to, and I, um, we will try to answer them as many as we can through some follow-up emails. Um, I think that the engagement here just highlights how, um, it, how, how this issue really is affecting all of us, whether you're a farmer or not, we've all been touched by the lack of resiliency in our food system in the last couple of years. And, um, it also that is highlights this opportunity that we have in this farm bill to start to make some of the the changes that we know, all know we need and and have historically been an uphill battle to achieve in this farm bill. Um, so with that said, um, please keep an eye out on your emails because we are going to send you some information on. Um, some of the policies that we discussed in this webinar and ways and, and things that we think are priority. Uh, items in this upcoming farm bill, and we are going to encourage you to take that list and send it to your representatives. Um, Wes says you have to send it 10 times. Keep hammering them with it. <laughs> now, don't send it 10 times. That's too many. <laughs> but get it out there. Um, and, and we'll be sending, um, a couple of folks have asked about a recording. A recording of this will be available and we'll send it out and it will be up on our YouTube channel. So all that information will be forthcoming. Uh, Greg, jump in. <laughs> yeah. We got a couple minutes. Oh, one last comment. Uh, um, I think it's uh, prudent that I ask every single person uh, to go to USDA's uh, the um, website and comment on the product of USA. Um, I've personally been working on the um, getting that one uh, changed. I think it's the most egregious uh, labeling error. And there's a bunch more egregious labeling issues, uh, but that's the most egregious. And I firmly believe that if we could get a bunch of comments uh, that you know the industry won't be able to push back as hard and USDA will be forced to not just change this one, but I think it could be the start of what could bring some uh, label integrity um, in the future because they could look at this one and say, hey, we got some others that we got to fix too. So please go comment on the product of USA, even if it's just one sentence or write a book, I don't care, anywhere in between. So. Yeah, thank you, Greg. We have a bunch of materials available for people who aren't familiar on the Farm Action website on that. And we're, there's a hashtag product of USA challenge, comment, tag three friends, get and, them to comment. And the other thing is that um, I highly encourage everyone to stay active and involved in this. I think, you know, it, it's been mentioned many times tonight, but, you know, the um, food supply is actually abundant and productive, but the um, pandemic showed that it's uh, not resilient at all. And that's in lots of people's minds. So I think we have the best potential ever uh, to get some actual uh, realistic change in this farm bill. So uh, I encourage everyone to stay involved. And uh, I, think, I think we could actually do something this time. And with that, I thank you all. And uh, thanks for joining us tonight. Thank you so much to all the panelists. We really appreciate you giving us an hour of your very busy days. And we look forward to seeing you and talking to you all soon. Thanks, everybody.